Acts chapter 5, verse 38 and 39 says, And now I say unto you, Refrain from these men and let them alone. For if this counsel or this work be of men, it will come to naught. But if it be of God, ye cannot overthrow it, lest haply ye be found even to fight against God. Um, I want to talk today, more of a detailed study, um, about why the Asbury revival failed. And it did fail. They canceled it. Um, you don't cancel a move of the Lord. Okay, If it is of God, it will not come to naught. It will continue. It will go on. And my little Camtasia video that I did where you record the screen and whatever, I didn't really go through a lot of scriptures. It was just intended. People asked me what I thought about the whole thing. It was intended to be very quick. Um, it was not really a real thorough going through the scriptures and refuting the arguments that not only the Asbury revival people would use, but also anybody in the modern world that will use, you know, that they say we have a revival happening and whatever else. I'm actually going to show you from the scriptures, the King James Bible, uh, the greatest Bible out there. Okay, uh, that was one of the attacks that came. Uh, the King James Bible, King James onlyism is indefensible. There aren't very many, very many educated people that would defend it. Um, I don't know anybody that has above a PhD or a high school education that defends the King James Bible. Uh, okay, Dr. Jack Mormon, uh, Dr. Edward Hills, uh, you know, DA weight, five earned degrees, you know, well, let's not talk about that. Uh, Dean John William Bergen, uh, you know where the book's at right now. Um, dean of a school, you know, back in the late 1800s, you know, very brilliant men have defended the King James Bible. So this nonsense thing of there's not much proof for the King James Bible, you're only showing your ignorance when you say that. Um, the authorized version, the King James Bible, as it is commonly called today, has a wealth of manuscript evidence backing up all of the different translation choices and, and whatever else. The received text is based on over 99% of extant Greek manuscripts. Scripts. I've been through all the arguments. I have videos on it, so that's not the point of this video. Um, <clears throat> but I'm going to show you because, you see, I want you to have an authoritative source that's not me and not your school or your church or wherever you're going to. You have to have the authority of the Scriptures. If it's a true revival of God, a true move of God, let me say it that way, then it will line up with the Scriptures. So the purpose of this study is not just to attack people at Asbury, the students down there, which were some very vile young people, very insulting, very nasty. Um, you can look at the video that I did and look in the comments section. They are extremely filled with hate, very narrow-minded, bigoted people. But that's not the main purpose of this. This study is going to give the scriptures to those of you out there who are confronted by people that are saying that they have revivals in their church or whatever else. Okay, I'm going to give you the scriptures that show that there are no end times revivals. All right, so the work came to naught. The university canceled it and it came out. Well, Francis Chan said that they actually had planned it a few you know, months in advance or whatever, a few weeks in advance. It was never a movement of the Holy Spirit. And let me just say this, the word revival in here in terms of a mighty spiritual movement, it appears nowhere. Uh, the concept of revival, I mean, think about what you're saying when you, when you come out with that. We're having a mighty revival. What do you need to revive? You revive a dead corpse. Uh, I serve a living Savior. You know, I, I serve a living Savior. He's in the world today. I know that He is living, whatever men may say. Okay, the old hymn says, which many of the young people probably don't even know that old hymn. But the fact is, my Savior's living. He doesn't need to be revived. Okay, he rose from the dead. He's alive forevermore in heaven, and his words are alive. Okay, I don't need to be revived. So right there, problem number one, uh, what is a revival? Most of the Methodist revivals that are there in the past, they were doing all sorts of unscriptural things. They get the jerks. Uh, no scripture for that. They would be, you know, doing ecstatic experiences and speaking in tongues and whatever, which we'll see what the speaking in tongues thing is about today in this study. It's going to be a detailed study. Um, and if you are open-minded and you want to go through the scriptures with me, 
we're going to look at the scriptures today. If you are a Bible-believing Christian and you say, yeah, I didn't believe it from day one, okay, I'm going to give you the scriptures and the arguments to use to refute any future revivals. Um, now, there are great works of God that are coming in the future. There's no question about that. All right, uh, Acts chapter 2 is one of them, which never occurred in the past nor to this very present, and I'll show you the proof of that. There's no such thing as Acts chapter 2. Uh, the, in the last days, my spirit's going to be poured out upon all flesh, and, and they'll try to quote that one, and I'm going to show you why it doesn't work. Okay, it didn't work in the first century when Peter quoted it. Um, he had limited knowledge. He, there was a, it was a time of transition there. We'll talk about that. But I'm also going to show you that it's not, you know, that that is coming in the future, but there are some very specific things that happen along with it that are not there with the Asbury Revival or any other modern, quote, revival. Um, so there is a great move of God that's coming. There's the 144,000 that are sealed in Revelation chapter 7. There's a lot of uh, Moses and Elijah. They come back, the two witnesses in, in Revelation chapter uh, 12, I think it is. Um, you know, and so there are spiritual movements that are coming. The catching up of the body of Christ is going to be a great spiritual movement because it will show who's saved and who's false convert, who's lost. Okay, a lot of people will be left behind that thought that they would be going up. So my whole point is there are some really great things coming, but right now we are in the end times before the catching up of the body of Christ, and there is no spiritual great awakening that will be happening. All right, so point number one, the Asbury revival and all other modern revivals are based on emotions and not scripture. Uh, we started singing and, oh, it just, uh, we could just feel the presence of the Holy Spirit there and whatever else. Uh, there's a danger to worship, a very serious danger to worship, and you better base your worship on Scripture. They that worship me, the Lord says, must worship me in spirit and in truth. Worship the Father, excuse me, must worship Him in spirit and in truth. The Spirit's there, but you also have to have truth. Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. John 17, 17 says that. So if you're doing worship that's not based on Scripture, your worship means nothing. It doesn't mean anything. I mean, if I said, um, let's have uh, uh, monster trucks and, and fireworks and we'll call it worship of Jesus Christ, you say, huh? Oh, we won't say Jesus. We'll just say, you know, uh, Fred Jones or something like that. We'll just make up a new name. You say, well, then that's not for Jesus. Yeah, that's the whole point. Okay, it has to be based on Scripture for it to be true worship. All right? Um, and thirdly, America is headed for judgment, not the blessing of God. America is a very wicked nation. So if you want to have a great spiritual movement, I'll tell you what it has to start with. It has to start with judgment. This nation needs to be judged. Okay, 2 Chronicles 7.14, you know, my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves turn from their wicked ways. There's repentance of sin there if you want to have national judgment or a national blessing, excuse me. Judgment has to come first. Self-judgment. So a lot of people try to, you know, pull that off too and that doesn't work. But let me show you the thing about there are no end time revivals very quickly here. We'll hit a couple of uh, passages. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Um, speaking about the end times here, it says Second. Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Um, there's a falling away in the end times, a apostasy, moving away from the truth. It's not revival and great spiritual awakening and whatever else. That's not there. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Let me look at the people that commented in the, in the video I did about the Asbury Revival thing. Hateful, hateful, terrible comments. People attacking me personally, attacking the way I look, attacking the way I was speaking and whatever else. Hateful. It wasn't a move of the Lord. This whole thing there. Again, they're giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. That's what they're feeling there. Oh, I can feel this stuff. I'm going to show you the proof. 
people that are possessed with devils often run and worship Jesus Christ. All right, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good. Hello. Um, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures, more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. Does that sound like revival in the end times? No, it doesn't. It's not revival. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. Are you reading a King James Bible? Are you looking at these scriptures for yourself? Or are you just trying to say that I'm a Pharisee, which we'll get to here in a minute? See, where's the end times revival? Show it to me. Great move of God as a nation's going into judgment. As a nation is falling apart, and America is falling apart. Um, there's an old saying Bob Jones Sr. used to say, which I have many issues with that man, but he said one thing right, and that was, war is God's judgment on sin here, hell is God's judgment on sin hereafter. When you get into eternity. War is coming. World War. World War III. How, when will it start, or how will it start, or whatever? I have no idea. It's already going on. Uh, they are already developing the theaters of operation in the Ukraine and also Taiwan, and there might be some in South America, uh, uh, well, yeah, South America, Venezuela and whatnot. Not sure about that one yet, but there's kinetic war, which means guns, bombs, bullets, the whole thing. And then there's also the new type of war, fifth generation warfare, which is online and within the banking systems and within the food supplies and within the all the different power grid stuff and whatever that's tied in with the internet and cybersecurity and hacking into different accounts and whatever, warfare is already going on. Um, it's incredible to think about what 21st century warfare is going to be like. But open admission of World War III, that hasn't happened yet, but it will be. The Bible says that there would be wars and rumors of wars in the end times. Matthew chapter 24 talks about that. The beginning of sorrows, which is where we are at doctrinally right now. So, let's go next to Matthew chapter 7. Because this is one of the big attacks that I got hit with, and you will get hit with it if you attack these, these uh, fake revivals. They'll say, judge not, lest ye be judged. Judge not. You're a Pharisee. You're, you're holding your scripture, your Bibles, your God, and your, your bibliolatry, and whatever else. No, I'm checking what you're doing with the scriptures. All right. If you're an Asbury revival person or Asbury student there at the university, uh, did you go there to just learn opinions or are you there to actually learn the scriptures? If you're there just to learn opinions, well, you probably should get saved. Right? Your opinions don't matter. The opinions of your, your professors don't matter. What do the scriptures say? This is the book right here that judges things. Matthew chapter 7. Let's look about the thing of judgment here. Beginning, beginning in verse 1. Judge not that ye be not judged. Oh, see, you can't judge. Uh, 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 uh. Keep reading. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. I can judge the modern Christian revival system because I used to be part of the modern Christian world. All right? And I got all that stuff out of my life. We'll see that here as we continue. And that's why I'm judging all these false revivals. There are no real revivals in the end times. None. What about Acts chapter... We're going to get to Acts chapter 2. Just wait. Verse 3. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye? Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. 
Lord's not saying here, don't judge anybody. He's saying, no, get the problems out of your own life. Hey, Brian, get out of the modern church system. Yes, sir, I'm out. I've got all that stuff out. I got rid of the CCM and I got rid of the wicked way I used to dress and the wicked way I would justify watching movies and all the other stuff that modern Christians do. I got it all out of my life so now I can see clearly. I have two clear eyes and a clear Bible here that I can read and I can judge you people out there. You see how that works? I'm not ignorant. I wasn't raised in some little secluded little Baptist cloistered, you know, happy little thing with, you know, Christian school. And I never went. I went to a public school and I went to big mega churches. I'll judge you with the word of God. Verse six, give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn again and rend you. Some of you are swine out there. Some of you are dogs out there. You're lost. You think that you're saved. You're false converts. And I'm casting pearls to you swine right now. And I'm sure you're going to try to take my words and turn them around against me and attack me and stab me in the back. Put your comments down below so everybody can see how hateful you are and how right I am. Okay? But my prayer is that there are some modern Christians out there that are actually concerned about what did the scriptures say? And actually want to follow along and actually want to see if you're right according to the scriptures. I'm here for you. I'm also here for the Bible-believing Christians out there, those that are born again and want to know the scriptures to use to expose these revivals in the future because there will be a lot more of these false revivals. I will promise you that. It's part of the invoking the spirit of Antichrist movement. The spirit of Antichrist has to be raised. And that's what these revivals are going to do. So my prayer is that some people might wake up from this and that the Bible believers, I'm going to arm you to go into battle with these revival people, these revivalites in the future. Verse 7, Ask and it shall be given you, seek and ye shall find, knock and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Or what man is there of you whom if he... If his son ask bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he give him a serpent? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask him? Therefore, all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Okay, the uh, way to heaven is very, or excuse me, the way to heaven is very narrow. The way to hell is very, is very broad. There's a lot of people that fall for this stuff. So when you look and you say, well, we have a lot of people. Uh, that's not a good standard. <laughs> All right. Verse 14, because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life and few there be that find it. All right. There's very few people that get into heaven. All right. So you have to remember that. Um, and I just want to say, we're not going to go there for sake of time, but I just want to say, if you actually look up when Jesus rebukes the Pharisees, he says, you make the word of God of none effect by your tradition. Now, of the two of us, you Asbury revivalites or other revivalites out there, um, are you basing everything that you're doing at your revival on the scriptures? Do the scriptures have the most prominent place at your revival? Or are there traditions of men that have come in and you're making the word of God of none effect by your tradition? What traditions am I elevating above the scriptures? I'm not. I have no traditions above these Scripture's right here. So uh, who's the Pharisee again? You are. Mark chapter 5. But you don't understand that there's worship that's been going on there. We have worship. I've seen the Spirit of God moving. I can feel the Spirit of God. Really? Are you sure? Are you sure that that worship is centered on Jesus Christ? Let's look here. Mark chapter 5, verses 1 through 9. And they came over unto the other side of the sea, into the, into the country of the Gadarenes. 
And when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit, a devil in him, who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no man could bind him, no, not with chains, because that he had been often bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces, neither could any man tame him. You know, it's kind of funny, let me just stop there. They have these power teams that go around to these modern churches, and these guys, they break chains. They'll put handcuffs on their wrists and they break them. And they break these things. So it's the power of the Holy Spirit. Really? Uh, chap book, chapter, and verse, please. Where does it say that they're breaking chains? In the book of Acts. The apostles are there doing, putting on shows, you know, uh, playing our God is an awesome God, you know, and loudspeakers and, and whatever else. And they're, you know, they're breaking chains. Uh, people that are possessed with devils do it. But I don't remember seeing any Christians doing it. Hmm. Are you going to judge by the word of God or by your own feelings and traditions? Remember, Pharisee, it's the scriptures, the authority, not your feelings. Very important. Verse 5, And always night and day he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. Do you ever see excessive crying at these church buildings? I knew a Baptist pastor the one time, and he would cry for effect. If the giving was down a little bit or whatever else. Oh, I'm such a bird for the lost. I don't work on you, Taylor. I just can't. <laughs> excessive crying. Hmm. Devil possessed people in church buildings? No, no, nothing like that. But when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him. The man with an unclean spirit, crying, cutting himself with stones. And he runs and he worships Jesus? Huh. You better be careful. You better be very careful. Oh, there's great worship going on. Praise and worship. Oh boy. Verse 7. And cried with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou, thou Son of the Most High God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. For he said unto him, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. Um, he said unto the man, Come out of the... Or he said unto him, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. He didn't say, Fire on her! Or something or like this Asbury Revival thing that I exposed. There's... Put fire on her. There's nobody in Scripture that did that. Never in Scripture will you see the thing of put fire on them, fire from the Lord on them. You're not going to see it anywhere. Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. Verse 9, And he asked him, What is thy name? And he, said, and he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. Huh. There's many devils that can go around. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. <coughs> 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 3 through 4. He said, but we, we, sell, we worship Jesus there. It's about Jesus. It's not about the Bible. It's about Jesus. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3. But I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety. So your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit, which, we have, which ye have not received, or another gospel, which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. Paul's saying, I'm worried because somebody can come in here and they can preach three different things. Another Jesus, another spirit, and another gospel. And that's exactly what goes on at these places. They're preaching another gospel. There's sodomite Christians there. Had one in the comments. I finally had to block him. I'm a gay Christian, a proud gay Christian. What is, okay. Uh, no, sodomy is an abomination in God's sight. You can't be saved and be continuing in that practice. Somebody did it in their past, okay, fine, get saved. You know, come to God as a sinner. It's a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And Paul says, of whom I am chief. Jesus died for sinners. 
But you can't have an abominable thing like sodomy and just continue in it. It doesn't work that way. But you have these sodomite professing Christians at this revival, and they're there. They're accepting another Jesus, another gospel, and then another spirit. Remember? What did it say in, in uh, 2 T Timothy, I think it was? It says, in the latter times, uh, or uh, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits. Yeah. Jump down to verse 13 there in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 13. Very important to get this too. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. There were no ministers of Satan there, I guess, at this revival, right? Uh, I think that there were a few, uh, probably most of them. All right, uh, yeah, not of God. And again, what protection do you have, young person out there? You're part of the Asbury University. You're part of some other university. What is your protection? How do you know that your professors aren't lying to you? Feelings? Emotions? Why well, like him? Why well, like her? <laughs> oh, okay. I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. You know, let's just ignore that. You know, what is in the New Testament there. Uh, you have to have the Bible. As your standard. That's the whole point here. Um, <clears throat> Numbers chapter 23. Back to the Old Testament. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. And is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That's why you read the whole Bible. You have to rightly divide it. You have to understand dispensational theology. But you have to be able to understand the whole totality of scripture. What's going on there. There are certain things that are true in any dispensation. Dispensation is how God dispenses his grace to man at different time periods. Obviously, in the Old Testament, Jesus had not died on the cross yet. Right? The New Testament does not begin in Matthew chapter 1. It begins with the death of the testator. See Hebrews chapter 9 for proof of that. Right? Uh, again, you're not dealing with somebody here that doesn't understand the scriptures and whatever. I've done years of preaching. No glory to me. I'm not trying to be prideful. I'm just saying, watch my videos. Learn the scriptures. You're never going to be taught uh, at your little university there, your seminary and whatever else. You will never be taught what I teach on this channel. And other great men of God have taught me these things. I didn't come up with them myself. And again, read the scriptures. Compare scripture with scripture. And you'll see that I'm right if you're born again. Uh, you have to have the Holy Spirit of God within you to understand these things. But Numbers chapter 23, verse 19, very important concept here, which we will see as we continue. Um, Numbers chapter 23, verse 19 says, God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? Okay, God is not a liar. Right? God will not contradict his word. Oh, God's going to do a new thing. We see God doing a new thing. Is it lined up, does it line up with Scripture? No. Uh, in fact, this the Bible actually kind of condemns it, but God's doing a new thing now. Uh-oh. Uh You're dealing with a liar when you start to find somebody that contradicts the Scriptures. The Roman Catholic Church, they hold divine tradition above sacred Scripture. I've done videos showing the proof of it from their own words, their own books and everything else. I have a whole huge shelf down here of, uh, Vatican catechisms and the Second Ecumenical Council, the whole thing, you know. I have all of that stuff. I know what the Catholic Church teaches. They overthrow the scriptures with their tradition, like the Pharisees did. Always remember that. Don't ever have somebody around that says, oh, we have this book of discipline, or we have this catechism, or we have this other thing here, and it's a greater authority than the scriptures themselves. There is nothing on this earth that is a greater authority than the scriptures. Not one thing, myself included. All right, Romans chapter 3. Let's go there. Romans chapter 3. Oh, well, there's an awful lot of scripture so far. He's covering a lot of scripture. Yeah, the time will come when they will not endorse sound doctrine. Uh, don't be one of those, please. Make sure I'm telling you the truth. Make sure that you, what 
you believe lines up with the scriptures. Romans chapter 3, verses 3 and 4 says, For what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? God forbid, yea, let God be true, but every man a liar. As it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings, and mightest overcome when thou art judged. See, I can overcome all these people with the Asbury Revival, or if any of the other fake revivals. I can overcome every single one of you. I can judge every single one of you because I have a perfect standard. I do. Well, I can find a, uh, uh, errors in the King James Bible. Okay, then join the atheists because they do the same thing. There are no errors in the King James Bible. There are areas that you think it could have been translated differently or whatever else. It should say, you know, Passover instead of Easter in Acts chapter 12, verse 4. That's not an error. Okay, and there's plenty of manuscript evidence and plenty of proof that it should be Easter. Pascha could be translated Easter or Passover. Uh, well, what about the Johann, Johannine comma? 1 John chapter 5, verse 7, it shouldn't be in there. There's not much manuscript support. Oh, actually, there's early church father citations. There's plenty of manuscript support for it. Uh, there's plenty of proof that 1 John 5, 7 should be in there. If you look at 1 John chapter 5 and you leave out verse 7, it doesn't even make any sense why you should leave it out. 1 John 5, 7 is one of the key scriptures that talks about the witness that we have in earth, which is the spirit and the water and the blood, verse 8, 1 John 5, 8 talks about that. It's talking about there are three that bear record in heaven. There are three that bear record on the earth. And if you study it, the Holy Spirit guides into all truth. It's not experiential, uh, emotional feelings. That's not what the Holy Spirit does. He comes and he guides into all truth. Truth that is founded upon the scriptures. And then you have the water and the blood. The water being a reference to washing of water by the word. Okay. The blood, what is that? The blood of the New Testament. Did a whole big study on that, the whole King Jesus version thing. Uh, way over the level of what you're ever going to find in a seminary. Just saying, you won't. It's not in there. Um, I've been contacted people that went through seminaries. Uh, men that are older than me that have gone through seminary schooling and have earned degrees and all kinds of things. And they say, I've never learned this stuff in seminary. The Lord showed you these things, Brother Brian. And I bring them out, and I don't charge you tuition to watch my videos. All you have to spend is your time. This ministry operates on free will donations or gifts from God's people, and that's it. Uh, you don't get charged to watch these videos, and I don't make any monetized income from YouTube. So, not a very good Pharisee, I guess, you know, if you want to call me one. Psalm 138, verses 1 and 2. You say, well, I just, I don't think the Bible's that important. You're, you're making a, it's a paper pope to you. Oh, uh, well, as it's been well said, at least my pope is perfect. Uh, the popes in Rome, the popes of Rome, they're far from being perfect. They are heads of a criminal corporation. That's what the pope is. <laughs> and if you do any research, you'll understand why I said that. Psalm 138, verses 1 and 2. I will praise thee with my whole heart. Before the gods will I sing praise unto thee. You want to praise the Lord, do you? Okay, here's how you do it. Verse 2. I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth, for thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. The word of God is magnified above the name of Jesus Christ, above the name of the Lord, Jehovah God in the Old Testament. This book is the greatest book that there is. Period. Uh, for a long time, you know, we had the Greek and the Hebrew and things, the Hebrew Old Testament, Greek New Testament, and there were translations that were made, the Old Latin Vulgate, not the Jerome's Latin Vulgate, the Old Latin Vulgate. There were other ancient translations that came before the King James Bible. But God decided for the end times to give us a perfect English Bible. And that's the standard that I believe in. You say, well, I don't believe it's perfect. Okay, then go find the one that is. Okay. And then you hold that up and you go and you preach that. Let me know what you find. Um, I have proved this book. Okay. In my life, I lived by this book. This book is real to me. Uh, if you don't, haven't had that experience, well, I'm sorry for you. 
John chapter 14, you say, well, I just want to make it about the love of Jesus. I just, I think that we just need to focus on the love of Jesus and not, not be so hard with the Bible. You know, let's just kind of leave the Bible out of it and, and just, you know, it's just not so much Bible and especially the old archaic King James Bible. Let's have the, the, you know, some of the new versions are okay. They read a little bit better. They're easier to understand. Yeah. They come from Vatican manuscripts two oldest and best manuscripts that they, you know, quote Vaticanus and Sinaiticus, um, yeah, come from the Vatican, you know, the, the church that hates Bible-believing Christians, the church that says that they hold divine tradition above sacred scripture. You know that church? You know, the one that, that molests children all the time and they're constantly covering it up? You know, yeah, yeah, that church, yeah, you know, with the sodomite priests and all the other problems, the one that had, you know, all the mafia members are part of it, baptized Roman Catholics, and Adolf Hitler was a baptized Roman Catholic, and the Nazi you know, regime, they signed a concordat with um, Pope Pius XII, Franz von Papen and Pope Pius XII, you can look that up. You know, you know that church, yeah, yeah. Oh. I don't think I want my Bible to come from there. Okay, well, Erasmus was a Roman Catholic, and he, he did the Textus Receptus and whatever else. No, he compiled manuscripts that later on that he got from the Greek Orthodox Church and later on it became known as the Texas Receptus but uh, the Vatican never approved his Greek text they never made a translation from Erasmus's Greek text so uh, yeah you need to study the issue more John chapter 14 verse 23 and 24 says Jesus answered and said unto him if a man love me hey do you love Jesus Modern Christians, do you love Jesus? Okay. He will keep my words. Don't tell me you love Jesus and you reject this book. There's no way. can't happen. And my Father will love him and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings. And the word which he hears not mine, but the Father's which sent me. You love Jesus, do you? What's your attitude towards the King James Bible? Well, I don't really prefer it. I don't really like it and whatever else. Okay, then you don't love Jesus. There's no argument. Okay? The new versions are corrupt. There's no question about that. They have all sorts of doctrinal errors. That's why a lot of them have gone out of print. I mean, go down and, and get a, an American standard version. Or how about a revised version? You know, I have them. See where I have the one up there. Right there's a, excuse me here. Right here we have a revised version. Very dirty, very dusty. Revised version of 1881. Right there. This was all the, the latest Bible manuscript uh, evidence and everything else. This is the Great one that just came out, Westcott and Hort. They found older and better manuscripts and older and better readings and whatever else. I had to search for years for that thing. If this work of this council be of men, it will come to naught. Revised version. Where's it at? At one time, it was the most accurate translation out there. And then they redid it, and they redid it, and they re keep having to redo it. And the NIV is not the original one that came out in 1974, the New Testament. And then they came out 1978 with the whole thing. And then they came out years later with the TNIV and the NIRV and, and all this other stuff. I've produced documentaries on the new version issue. So again, oh, you're just a Pharisee. You don't understand and whatever else. Oh, I understand it very well. And if you would actually look into who I am without judging me, First, you would realize, oh yeah, the guy isn't so dumb after all. <clears throat> First Peter chapter 1. You have a lot of pride and you have... The I have to speak as a fool occasionally and explain who I am and what I've done over the years for the Lord. Because otherwise people will just mock me and say, oh, you don't know anything at all. You don't understand the issue. You're ignorant and whatever. I'm not ignorant. Okay, I have <clears throat> most of the... Uh, books and things here that you would have with any seminary professor and whatever else. First Peter chapter 1 verse 23 <clears throat> through 25. Being born again, 
not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God. Lowercase w, it's, it's the written word, it's not the manifest word, the capital W, like you see in John chapter 1. Uh, <clears throat> the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. Do you have a living copy of the word of God? Or do you just have a dead book? I have a dead book, but, a, but my spirit tells me what to do. And I kind of go with emotions and whatever else. That's very dangerous. How do you know that you aren't worshiping another Jesus? Or believing in another gospel? And following another spirit? How do you know? Hmm. Verse 24. For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man is the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. Do you believe that? Or is the word of God just some original manuscript, you know, autographs that have faded away and they're gone and we just have corrupted copies of copies of copies? Then how do you know that you're believing anything that matters? What's your standard of truth? It's a problem. Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19. <clears throat> well, I just don't think we should insist on one translation of the Bible. I think that there could be multiple ones. Why? <laughs> Isn't it safer just to say, hey, you know, let's just have one Bible? No, I, like, I think we should update it occasionally. What if it's updated wrong? What if there are poisonous things that have been brought into it? bad translation errors and things that you get from the Vatican. Acts chapter 19, verse 13, <clears throat> down through verse 20. Then certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, took upon them to call over them which had evil spirits the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, We adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preacheth. Lost people trying to use the name of Jesus and cast out devils like the revivals. And there, was, and there were seven sons of one Siva, a Jew, and chief of the priests, which did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are ye? And the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them and overcame them and prevailed against them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. And this was known to all the Jews and Greeks also dwelling at Ephesus. And fear fell on them all and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. If it was a real movement of the Lord and there were actual real devils being cast out, fear would fall on the lost world. Not, oh, that's very nice. Let's report on that. It's on Fox News. Tucker Carlson talked about it and Glenn Beck talked about it. So it must be legitimate. What? No. Fear would come upon lost people and they'd say, oh, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. But look what else gets uh, magnified. Remember back in Psalm 138, verse 2? God's magnified His word above His name. Verse 18, And many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. Many of them also which used curious arts brought their books together and burned them before all men. And they counted the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. Was there any book burning going on? Down there at the Asbury Revival? At your modern revivals that are out there? Are there, you see any kind of confessing of sin, any kind of, hey, I was messing around in the occult. I want to bring my book in here. My book's on Harry Potter, which has witchcraft in it. My book's on uh, Lord of the Rings. John Ronald Rule Tolkien, a known occultist, Order of the Golden Dawn. And he's writing his books with wizards that are t types of Jesus. <laughs> I mean, what a blasphemous thing to do. The Bible talks about not seeking after wizards to be defiled by them. Let me think about the underlying message there. Oh, Gandalf is a type of Jesus Christ. Really? Oh, so you have a good wizard and a bad wizard. Oh, you mean white magic and black magic? Did a whole thing refuting the whole Lord of the Rings thing. Completely satanic. And yet, how many modern Christians in their churches and things think very highly of those? Ronald, John Ronald Rule Tolkien, by the way, was a fanatic Roman Catholic. Pre-Vatican II, Roman Catholic. Hmm. As was C.S. Lewis, by the way, too. He was a closet Catholic. Believed in purgatory. But uh, look at verse 20. 
so mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. Verse 17, Fear fell on them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. Verse 20, So mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. And it's talking about written word again. It's a lowercase w. So a real spiritual move will make this book grow, and more people will magnify this book along with the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Word of God, all of a sudden people will have a hunger for this book. That's what a real move of God is all about. Where was the hunger for the Word of God at the Asbury Revival? Where, was the, where is the hunger at the modern revivals that come out while this thing is out, this video, and after this video is out? Is there a hunger for the King James Bible? There won't be. Guarantee it. Acts chapter 2. Let's go to Acts chapter 2 now. Since we're here in the book of Acts. And we're going to look at this thing of this end times, you know, last days. In the last days my spirit will pour out, you know, on all flesh. And the charismatics love this verse. They love this portion of scripture. But when you actually go through it, you realize, wait a second here. This is not the charismatic movement. This is something completely different. All right. The charismatics, um, there are certain uh, key passages that cults will go to. The hyper dispensationalists have their portions of scripture where Paul says, you know, you know, Christ sent me not to baptize. And they say, see, baptism is not necessary. And they'll get into all this stuff and they'll get you all mixed up in things. And, and uh, you know, Paul talks about my gospel, you know, the gospel that was revealed to Paul. And they say, see, Paul preached a different gospel than Peter and James and John. They go to certain passages. Hyper Calvinists go to certain passages where they can prove that you were chosen in God, you know, in Christ before the world began and all this stuff, taking verses out of context. Um, charismatics will have their favorites. And Acts chapter 2 is the key passage for charismatics. This is where they go. And once you learn the proper interpretation of these verses, you say, uh, no, hold on. <laughs> I know exactly where you're going. I know exactly how you're going to interpret this these verses here, and I'm going to debunk you before you can even get your start. All right, Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 1 and going down to verse 22. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. They were all in agreement with one accord, in other words. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And of course, the charismatics will use that to talk about the Holy Ghost and they'll, they'll breathe, you know, the wind and all this stuff. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire. It doesn't say of fire. And you'll hear this thing. I've heard it so many times, even among conservative Baptists. They'll say the tongues of flame or the, you know, the tongues of fire, you know, appeared and whatever. It doesn't say that. It says cloven tongues like as of fire. They were not fire. And again, I challenged people out there and I said, where does the Bible say that God is a fire? And somebody said, well, the Bible says in the book of Hebrews that our God is a consuming fire. That's true. All right. But when it comes to the Holy Spirit here, it's not saying he's a fire. The tongues of fire came and whatever else. No, it says like as a fire. Just like the thing when Jesus or when the Holy Spirit descends down, when Jesus is being baptized, it says he descended like as a dove. Similar in the way he floated down. It does not say he was a dove. Uh, very another, another very important distinction. I mean, God, uh, the Godhead is not made up of two men and a bird. All right? Uh, no, there's a spirit there. And he descended down like as a dove. Here he is like cloven tongues, like as of fire. They're not fire. So watch out for this strange fire that people bring out at these revivals and they fire on you and I put fire and all this stuff. It's strange fire. Warned about in the Old Testament. And it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. The Holy Spirit gave them other tongues. You say, oh, what other tongues were these? The, the heavenly tongues, the tongues of angels. No, it lists them. Verse 5, And they were dwelling at Jerusalem, devout or, excuse me, and they were dwelling at Jerusalem, Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded, because they, that every man heard them speak in his own language. So you mean tongues are languages? That's correct. Tongue is a Bible word meaning language. 
It's not some special, you know, that's not it at all. You don't just make it up. Oh, you're blaspheming the Holy Ghost. No, actually, when you fake speaking in tongues, you are blaspheming the Holy Ghost. Now, remember, you're lifting your traditions above the scriptures. Pharisee, do you remember? Well, I just can't believe, I, I won't be talked to this way. I love you. That's why I'm telling you the truth, you see. If I was like the people that taught you, by good words and fair speeches, they deceive the hearts of the simple. That's what false prophets do. I'm not a false prophet. I'm speaking to you the truth. Tongues are languages, and they list them here. Let's look at this. Verse 7, And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and the dwellers in Mesopotamia and in Judea and Cappadocia in Pontus in Asia, uh, Phrygia and Pamphylia in Egypt and in, in the parts of Libya around Cyrene and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians. We do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. See, the real gift there was all of a sudden these people there and they're saying, are not all these which speak Galileans? They're from Galilee, but I'm hearing them speaking in my language there. Uh, Parthians and Medes and Elamites. I'm hearing them speak my language. How is this possible? They're speaking perfectly. I can understand what they're saying about the wonderful works of God in my own language wherein I was born. You say, well, what about unknown tongues? There are no unknown tongues in Acts chapter 2. Unknown tongues show up in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 through chapter 14. That's why there's interpreters there. There are no interpreters needed when you're speaking sign gift tongues right there. You see? There's a gift of tongues and interpretation of tongues that happens for Christians today. There are certain Christians that can learn languages. They're very good at learning lots of languages. They can make translations of Bibles and, and other things into other languages. They have a gift for speaking in tongues learning other languages, in other words. Then there are people that are very good at interpreting those tongues. There's a gift there. That's the sign gift for today. All right, the gift for today, I should say. The sign gift that's given here in Acts chapter 2 is to confirm the word to the Jewish people. That's what it's there for. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22. All right, we'll, uh, yeah, we'll look at it here in just a minute. So, you have to understand, you have to compare Scripture with Scripture. There are no unknown tongues in Acts chapter 2. The unknown tongues show up later in the Pauline epistles, after the nation of Israel has had these initial sign gifts shown to them. It's right there. But look at verse 12 and 13. And they were all amazed and, and were in doubt, saying one to another, What meaneth this? Others mocking, said, these men are full of new wine. Oh boy. Hashtalashantai untai a bow tie. You know, there I spoke in tongues. Oh, you've blasphemed the Holy Ghost. Oh no. Wait a second. The people right here mocked. They said they're full of new wine. They're drunk. They were mocking the true sign gift of the Holy Spirit speaking in tongues through the believers. They mocked. What was Peter's reaction? Verse 14, But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, You've blasphemed the Holy Ghost. There's no forgiveness to... Is that what he says? No. Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken, as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. Where's the blaspheming the Holy Ghost thing there? Which, by the way, if you actually want to do the study on that, what is the unpardonable sin? I have a whole sermon on it. Um, the unpardonable sin is only possible when Jesus Christ is physically on the earth. Um, see, you can be confused about who I am. You can look at me and say, oh, that guy's not saved or whatever else. I'm not God manifest in the flesh. But Jesus Christ, when he was walking around on the earth, he was God manifest in the flesh. So when people would say, you have a devil's spirit, your spirit is evil and whatever, they're blaspheming the Holy Spirit. Right? The Holy Spirit is connected to my spirit, but I am not 100% Holy Spirit inside. Okay? So I can say some things that are stupid and whatever else, 
and you can mock me for that, and you've not blasphemed the Holy Ghost, even though I have the Holy Ghost living within me. My body is a temple of the Holy Ghost. All right, but I'm not in perfect 100%. Everything I say is perfect. Jesus Christ was. That's why he said at the time, you know, that you will not be forgiven in this world or in the world to come. What does that mean for today? See, Jesus is saying you can blaspheme, you can attack me, the physical manifestation of God, the body of God, but don't go after my spirit because it's the Holy Spirit and he doesn't say anything wrong. Right? I'm just a man. You're looking at me, a mortal man. I'm going to bleed. I'm going to die on the cross. You can laugh at that and make fun of that and whatever else, but not my spirit. That's what Jesus was saying. So again, watch out for this charismatic practice. If you're a new Christian, you're going to get it. When you go after these charismatics and you say you're speaking in tongues as gibberish, well, you've blasphemed the Holy Ghost. You've, you're in danger of committing the unpardonable sin. You better be careful. You better ask God to forgive you for that or whatever. And yet the scripture says if you've committed it, you can't be forgiven. <laughs> so uh, charismatics are nuts. All right. Uh, when you actually have the true sign gift of speaking in tongues and the people make fun, they mocked. Peter never says anything about you've blasphemed the Holy Ghost. You've committed the unpardonable sin. It doesn't say anything about it. But here's where we get into the thing of uh, where's there an end times revival? Great spiritual moving and whatever else. Okay. Here's where the charismatics will run to. They come here and they say, oh, look, see, see, here it is. Verse 16, but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, and it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And all my servants and all my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. Wow, charismatic revivals are real, man. Wow, because see, it's last days, dude. And so therefore, we have a real prophet, or we have a real, you know, thing here, revival. We're reviving our dead corpse, man. Yeah. Uh, no, Peter was wrong. Peter was not given the revelation of how much time would be there with what we would call the church age. So if you remember, chapter 1, go back to Acts chapter 1, um, And see if I can find it here very quickly. Um, verse 6, chapter 1, verse 6. When they, when they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? <laughs> no. <laughs> um, he didn't do it in the first century. He didn't restore the kingdom to Israel. So they were confused about some of the prophetic timeline stuff there. So when Peter stands up and he says, what you're seeing here with the speaking in tongues, we're in the last days. I believe that this was written in the prophet Joel there in the Old Testament about the second coming. I think we're really close to the second coming. That's what he's referring to. The miracles that happened there in the time of Jacob's trouble. That's what Peter is saying, that he believes that this is happening. You say, well, but it, but it did happen. It happened right there when he was speaking it. No, it didn't. How do you know? Keep reading. Uh, verse... 19, okay? Acts chapter 2, verse 19. And I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great, that great and notable day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs... To back to that in a minute, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. Who's he speaking to? Again, I brought this up to some of these charismatic nuts. Who's this whole passage here? Who's it speaking to? Speaking to Jews. There are no Gentiles present. Hmm. The signs are given for the Jews, you see. Now, <clears throat> Acts chapter 2. Oh, um, it was the last days and they had this great pouring out of the Spirit upon all flesh. Really? Um, did the whole thing come to pass? Oh, it was just a partial fulfillment, I guess, you know, that some of them, you know, that the Spirit, you know, was upon all flesh and everything else there. And um, 
uh, I, they were speaking in tongues. It doesn't say that they were prophesying and doing all this other stuff. Right? Now, there was some prophecy type of things that happened throughout the book of Acts, don't get me wrong, but this was not the events that Joel was prophesying. Those events are preceding the second coming of Jesus Christ. That's why you read about it in Matthew chapter 24, Mark chapter 13, Luke chapter 17, Luke chapter 21. That's when it happens, before the second coming. The uh, I will show wonders in heaven above and in signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before that great and notable day of the Lord come. Okay? That didn't happen in the first century. It didn't happen in Acts chapter 2. And again, Peter, the, this was the transitional nature of the early part of the book of Acts. He's saying, we don't really know what's coming here. This, you know, if the nation of Israel were presenting Jesus Christ to you as your Messiah again, we're giving you another chance. And, you know, you could make the argument that if they would have accepted Jesus as their Messiah, um, I mean, you had 3,000 people get saved there on the day of Pentecost, to read later down in there. But if the whole nation would have turned to God and said, okay, yeah, we were wrong. We crucified God, our, our Messiah. We crucified him. That was a really dumb thing to do. The last days could have been right then, and that would have been the end and whatever else. And the Lord would have come back, second coming. But it didn't work out that way. And here we are, 2,000 years later approximately, and we're still waiting for the Lord's return. Okay, a little bit less than 2,000 years, I get it. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22. So the kingdom was being offered there. The you know, reign of Jesus Christ and things, it was being offered. But they rejected. So a lot of the promises got put off. So it's not that Peter was giving a false prophecy. He was just simply saying, this is the start of it here. This could start this thing. And if you accept Jesus Christ as your Messiah, ye men of Israel, the Jews, you know, that he's speaking to there, if you'll accept, <clears throat> if you'll accept Jesus as your Messiah, we can get this thing done. That's what was being said there. So to use that today as Gentiles to prove your revival is legitimate and it's the same thing, okay, then you better make the sun get dark and the moon turn into blood and the whole thing. <laughs> Okay, uh, I don't think so. That's not happening. <clears throat> First Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. Uh, you look at the, again, you study the ancient nation of Israel. Israel begins with signs and wonders. The, uh, the Sabbath day is a sign, perpetual sign between the Lord and the Jewish people. The circumcision thing, that's a sign. Uh, he brings them out of Egypt as a nation. There's signs and wonders over and over again, blood and fire and smoke and, the, you know, the rivers being turned into blood. Same thing happens in the time of Jacob's trouble. Again, I did an old study, the coming Exodus. You can listen to that. Uh, Moses leads the children of Israel out of Egypt. Hmm. Um, in the book of Revelation, Jerusalem is called the city where our Lord was crucified. It's called that and it says, um, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt. Huh. Moses leads the children of Israel out of Egypt. In the future, Jerusalem is called Egypt. When they see the abomination of desolation standing in the holy place, they're to flee Jerusalem. Okay, there's a lot of deep stuff here that I can't just cover in one video. All right, I've covered this stuff. It's taken me years to preach all of this. All right, you have to understand that. Um, and I could keep going on and on about this whole thing, but please understand there are no end times revivals unless you believe that you're part of a dead corpse that needs to be resuscitated. Sorry, but that's just the way it is. End times great movements of God. Uh, the next one that will be there will be the catching up of the body of Christ. And very few people are going to be leaving, by the way. Very few. Because there are very few people that are genuinely born again and accept this beloved book. They say that they love Jesus, but they reject the King James Bible. All right. <clears throat> Very important to understand that. But let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12 through 16. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Okay? If there's a spiritual movement, if the Holy Spirit starts to work in your life, you're going to see it's not the spirit of the world. 
It's not that other spirit that Paul warned about in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Uh, it's the Holy Spirit of God. But the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. I don't charge for anything that I do. Okay? Like I said, there's no YouTube monetization coming for these videos. If they put ads in the beginning, it's because they're going against what I've asked them. You know, please don't put ads on my videos. They do it anyhow. And they make all the money. Again, I've showed proof. Uh, I don't make any money from these videos. So I'm doing everything, offering it for free. You know, uh, I have external hard drives on my website. Well, I have to charge something for the labor put into that and whatever else. All the videos I've done over the years, many of which were deleted by YouTube. I put that out. Okay, I can't just give those away for free. They cost me a lot of money to make. A lot of time and a lot of money. Um, but this ministry operates People freely give gifts to the ministry, and we continue. For as long as the Lord says, okay, keep this up, I'll continue doing it. So it's freely given to you of God. Which things also we speak. That's what I do. Not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth. I'm not a seminary-educated PhD, PhD, THD, THM, you know, all the stuff. I don't have that. It's about the Word of God but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Spiritual things are this book. Okay, now there's a spirit of fellowship that's there among the body of Christ, certainly. You will have that. But if you just go, go completely your feelings and your opinions and your emotions, that's not comparing spiritual things with spiritual. You have to understand that. Verse 14. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. The natural man there is somebody who's lost. They're not born again. That's why they don't understand this book. That's why lost people come along and they say, we need to update the King James Bible. Uh, I don't understand it. Yeah, because you're lost. <clears throat> Verse 15. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. I'm going to stop it there. I could keep going on and on about this whole thing. But hopefully that gives you a basis for refuting this revival stuff as it gets spread out even more. And they try to make it this thing of, all oh, the Lord's doing this brand new work. And we have the, the Jesus revolution. Does it line up with scripture? Uh, well, no, not exactly. But it doesn't have to because we have another Jesus and another gospel and another spirit to lead us. And you a bunch of Pharisees come out and you overthrow the word of God. You make the word of God of none effect by your tradition. You're a Pharisee. And you know what? Um, you say, well, then you're just an old, dyed-in-the-wool old Baptist, you know, that likes to be in his church building. and whatever. No, I reject all that stuff too. You know why? Because it's not founded on the scriptures. If you study under this ministry, if you take some time, and that's all it costs you, you can watch all of my videos and never give me one cent. Just say, no, I'm not giving that guy anything I don't believe in. I'm, you know, whatever, I'm just going to watch this guy and see what he has to say. I'm going to go through the scriptures and check the scriptures to see if these things are so. You can do that. Go ahead. I'm, I can't stop you. But what you'll learn if you do it is you'll learn that I have an authority, and it's this book right here. And I do not change this book. I do not question this book. I am such a weirdo that I actually believe that I hold God's word in my hands. You say, well, of course, we all have God's word, which just comes in different translations. <laughs> okay, then you have a confused God. All right, my God's not confused. My God gave me a book. And I used the new versions, by the way, for a long time, about 25 years of my life. I'm getting to be an old man now. I'll be 48 years old this year. Um, so over half of my life was using new versions. So don't talk to me about that either. Oh, you're just a King James only. You've been raised in a cult and whatever. No, I haven't. No, I haven't. Uh, modern Christian, NIV using New American Standard Version before that, um, used other versions and things. So um, watch my other videos. Take some time to study. And uh, don't be deceived by this revival stuff. And when the mainstream media comes out and they start to say, 
oh, we're starting to see this great working of God. And oh, let's have a Hollywood movie about Jesus and, and about Chuck Smith and about Greg, whatever his name is there. Um, let's, let's have these movies. Let's promote Christianity. And I saw uh, this wicked Will Smith, this sodomite pervert Hollywood guy. And he comes out and, oh, I feel God's called me to spread his love around. Uh -huh. And they're going to be doing more of that stuff. They're going to preach another Jesus, you see. They're going to invoke the spirit of Antichrist, raise that spirit of Antichrist up so that when he shows up on the earth, people will be readily, oh, just, oh, we can't wait to worship this guy. They want to get you away from the book. Do you understand? America. America, America, God shed his grace on thee. Why? Because we had one book that we believed in. That's why. It wasn't because we had the emotions and we all loved Jesus. No, it was because we had a book. And a lot of our laws were written based on the scriptures. We have certain unalienable rights. Where do they come from? You can't place liens on them. You can't make any laws against these rights that come from God's word. But I'd rather just overthrow the scriptures and have my feelings. Okay, what if other people do the same thing and their feelings contradict your feelings? And they have a feeling that you should be put into a camp someplace. You should be silenced. You should have your freedom of speech taken from you. Well, who's to say it's wrong? We can all have our own feelings. We make our own truth. See, that's the danger. There's no danger in what I believe. Hey, I have, I'm held accountable to a Bible. One book. I'm not going to run off to Greek and Hebrew and try to change the word when I can't understand it. So that is going to be it. I can rant and rave for a lot longer, but I'll just stop right now. Um, don't be deceived by these revivals. Don't be deceived by political leaders that come out and they, oh, I'm a Christian and whatever else and things. Understand the scriptures. It gets worse. Evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Deception, deception, deception. Warning, you're going to be lied to in the end times. Unless it comes through television and Hollywood. <laughs> so that is going to be it. Please have discernment. Please watch my videos. Write your comments, thumbs up, thumbs down, whatever you feel like doing, whatever. Um, YouTube is not about to promote this channel. I've been here for a very long time. I should probably have hundreds of thousands of subscribers, but uh, this channel is not for everybody, quite frankly. The Lord hides th this channel from a lot of people. I firmly believe that. So um, share the videos with people. Take my videos, put them, mirror them on your other channels and things. I'd say, please don't cut them up and whatever and try to make me look like a fool. But so many people do that. Uh, they just twist my words and make me say things that I've never taught. Um, those videos are out there. The hit pieces on Brian Denlinger. There's plenty of those out there. Um, Lost World Hates Me. That's what the Bible said would happen about a true servant of the Lord. So I accept it. But um, don't fall for this revival stuff. So that is going to be it. Thank you very much for watching. King James Video Ministries has been faithfully preaching and teaching from God's Word since 2008. Our YouTube channel has never been monetized and we do not accept money from the lost world because this would violate the scriptures. King James Video Ministries is supported by saved brethren in accordance with 1 Timothy chapter 5 verses 17 through 18. If you have been blessed by our videos, we would ask that you prayerfully consider supporting this ministry financially. You can donate online by visiting www.kingjamesvideoministries.com or by sending a check or money order to King James Video Ministries, P.O. Box 214, Patton, Maine, 04765. Thank you to all who donate to this ministry, and we pray for the Lord's blessing in your lives.